I hope you're nice and cozy wherever you are. It's Life with Aaron, and have I got a story for you. Today we find ourselves in Sewanee, Tennessee, at the Templeton Library. An imposing structure, if I've ever seen one. And it has views to match. Another thing that makes this library unique, you can't go inside. But to understand the library, we need to understand the man, Sir John Templeton. Each of us should try to make our life beneficial. We don't know why God put us here. It may have been that we are supposed to make the best use of our life to serve humanity in general. I, I used the talents that I thought God gave me to select investments for people. John Marks Templeton was born November 29, 1912, in the small town of Winchester, Tennessee. From his mother, he learned the value of education and to explore new ideas with a perpetual sense of optimism. His father was a lawyer and entrepreneur who taught young John his earliest lessons in finding opportunities where others could see none. John was an exceptional student who graduated first in his high school class and was the first in his town to attend college. His determination and scholastic achievements took him to Yale University, but unfortunately, the depression soon drained the family's finances. When I was second year at Yale, my father told me that he couldn't give me even one dollar to go back to college. I thought that was a tragedy, but it turned out to be one of the greatest blessings anybody ever gave me because it made me an adult. It made me stand on my own two feet. And stand on his own two feet he would. He would pay for the remainder of his college education by working three jobs as well as being quite the savvy poker player he would leave with a master's in law. And John's next stage would be the world stage. He would visit 40 countries, and he would realize, for him, a global company was to come. In Sir John's lifetime, he would give out $1 billion, making him one of the most generous philanthropists of all time. In fact, he made the Time Magazine 2007's list the most powerful givers. He renounced his citizenship in 1964 in the United States so that he could funnel another $100 million that he would have paid in taxes to give away. By 1937, Sir John would go to Wall Street, and by 1940, he would start his own mutual fund. That fund would be one of the most successful to date. It has been said that Sir John was the best and most prolific stock picker of the 20th century. By the 1980s, after amassing an impressive fortune and a philanthropic record to perhaps be rivaled by no one, Sir John turns his attention to spirituality. Do you think if we spend more money, we're going to learn more about our souls? Oh, yes, absolutely. How? Uh, in many different ways. I'll give you one illustration and I'll come back to the question. This week, my, one of my foundations is publishing a book called A Bibliography of Research by Natural Scientists on Spiritual Subjects. And there are over 150 uh, articles that we've collected from learned journals, peer-reviewed journals of the high scientific standard where scientists have, have been studying spiritual matters. For example, none of us doubt that such a thing is love, and yet what little has been done to scientifically to study love. It's beginning, though, or prayer, or worship, or all these other things that are of spiritual nature can be studied, and if they were studied, would be a marvelous thing. We're beginning but, to see a dawning of the understanding of the effects of meditation on a physical body. Yes. Is that what, the kind of thing you're talking about? That would be one study, but it would be only one of hundreds or thousands of studies that we should be doing. Um, let's put it this way the amount that is being spent worldwide for scientific research today in terms of United States money is about a billion dollars a day. Suppose we spent one-tenth that much on, on spiritual research. What do you think that... That would be a hundred million dollars a day spent on spiritual research 
and that is more than has been spent on spiritual research in the history of the earth. And we, I hope that eventually, not too far away, we'll be doing it per day. So is this simply the case of a billionaire trying to buy his way into heaven? Maybe. Or, maybe, over the course of a lifetime, having achieved everything monetarily possible, you start to understand what's really important. Regardless of his true intention, he would start three foundations, and one of which awards the Templeton Prize every year. Always just a bit more than the Nobel Prize, because, well, you gotta be the best. And it only awards prizes to religious studies. Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, all have won the prize all prize winners having in common that they could show how religion and science can coexist. Owning a base of operations near the place he grew up, near Winchester, Tennessee. He had his sights set on Sewanee, Tennessee, next to the University of the South, a library to rival all others that could be seen for miles that would have books, more books than possibly you've ever seen meeting rooms on the upper floors so that when dignitaries, heads of state, celebrities came in to have meetings with Sir John as they often did, he would be able to greet them in his hometown. As construction started on this massive library, this vision that this captain of capitalism had, tragedy would strike. Just one month after the horror of the Twin Towers coming down in 9-11, on October the 11th, 2001, students from nearby University of the South wanted to get a closer look at the building project. With them was freshman Wesley Collins Mitchell from Vermont. The building was locked, and in an effort to get in, Wesley went down what he thought was a laundry chute. Unfortunately, it was not. In fact, in a plot straight out of a horror movie, what Wesley had actually went down was the trash chute into an automatic compactor where the young man was crushed to death. Because of the bizarre nature of this death, you can understand people's disbelief. Uh, a lot of people thought it was a hoax. Even to this day, there's an obituary online that lists the cause of death as an automobile accident. And that was not the case. He died in the library as described. Dealing with the tragedy, the building project would soldier on. Now with a lifelike painted bronze statue of Sir John, seemingly beckoning all those who would to come. But the glitz was off the project, and perhaps the desire of the man himself. By the mid-2000s, the building project complete, the library was still not being used. And in 2008, Sir John in the Bahamas, died of pneumonia at the age of 95. In the ensuing years, as the library is maintained by the Templeton Foundation, many ideas were bandied about. Ultimately, parts of the library now serve as apartments and are currently rented out. But mysteries still persist about the library to this day. And in fact, if you go to the website Atlas Obscura, it's portrayed as some sort of gothic castle and Sir John, a Edgar Allan Poe type character, when reality is completely different from that. In the end, did Sir John find his spiritual enlightenment? And will his foundation that has paid out nearly $70 million in the Templeton Prize ever get us closer? Well... That's a story, I guess, for another day.